Let me tell you about my friend Sean. When I first met him three years ago, he was lying in a hospital bed with severe heart failure. At the time, he was a 46-year-old chain smoker with obesity and ADHD. So at the time, back then, as his cardiologist, I didn't know why his heart had failed. But in retrospect, I think it was because his life had become all work and no play. And when I say play, I mean leisure time, physical activity, having fun with at least one other person. This kind of play is not a luxury. It's really a necessity. In fact, let's call it vitamin P. So what are the symptoms of vitamin P deficiency? Well, first you lose the twinkle in your eye and the spring in your step. And then as the play deficit worsens, you'll notice that <clears throat> all the people around you have become intolerably annoying. And then when the pent up stress gets to so bad from this no fun existence, people start self-medicating. In Sean's case with sugar, tobacco, and Adderall, which is an amphetamine. The thing is, Sean is actually a really fun guy, naturally. Um, here he is with his wife, Andrea, on their wedding day six years ago. And since his scrape with death, he's actually rediscovered his love of making music. And he plays enthusiastically with his punk rock band for several hours each week. Play is nature's remedy for stress. And it has done wonders for Sean. So here he is. Um, before and after, he's 75 pounds lighter. He's completely off sugar and, and tobacco and Adderall. And his, uh, his heart went from weak and enlarged, nearly dead, to perfectly normal. By the way, Sean is also the creative genius who uh, does the graphic art for my TEDx talks. Thank you, Sean. So last September, I was in Copenhagen collaborating with my friends Peter and Jacob uh, on the Copenhagen City Heart Study. And we queried this unique and powerful database with a simple but unanswered question. Do various leisure time physical activities have different effects on life expectancy? And the analysis of that result will be published soon in the Journal of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And you folks are the first people to hear about these potentially game-changing implications. So all of the different physical activities that they collected, you know, the, all this information for decades, improved life expectancy. No shocker there. But there were shocking differences in the life expectancy gain depending on what people were doing most of the time. The people who went to the gym to work out, they lived an extra 1.5 years compared to the sedentary people. The runners, they did even better, twice as good. 3.2 years. The swimmers, better still, 3.4 years. The cyclists, and they love their bikes in Copenhagen, that's one of the most popular activities, they lived 3.7 years longer. The soccer players, I know here in Manchester, that you'll be interested to know that, they lived 4.7 years longer, but I'll bet you'll never guess who did the best. Badminton players lived 6.2 years longer, and tennis players lived a whopping 9.7 years longer. So Peter and I, last, uh, last September, were staring at this data when Jacob, this very bright biostatistician, looks over at us in this and says to me, could this be true? I said, well, did you statistically adjust it, Jacob, like for all the usual confounders like age and gender and education and income? He said, fully adjusted. These numbers are highly statistically significant. But they're so counterintuitive. I mean, could badminton really be better than running and swimming and cycling for making you live longer? Well, I'll have to say, I didn't know what to make of the findings at the time, but I wasn't ready to dismiss them out of hand either because the Copenhagen City Heart Study was founded by Peter 40 years ago. And since then, they have been following 20,000 Danes closely with respect to exercise and lifestyle, health and longevity. This study has been a wellspring of landmark publications that have, that have changed our fundamental understanding of exercise and long-term health. 
Even so, I put it on a back burner, and for the next few days, I had fun with my Danish friends, cycling and kayaking and walking around uh, in Copenhagen and experiencing what they famously refer to as Hugo. I'm sure they would make fun of my accent on that. <laughs> but this is the warm feeling of, of gratitude for companionship and simple comforts. So on the flight home the next day, I was staring out the clouds and kind of musing about these curious findings from our study, when suddenly it dawned on me, maybe these longevity benefits were really being conferred by playing with others rather than strenuous exercise. After all, the sports that seemed to require two or more people to play together were the ones that, in fact, improved longevity the best, whereas the solitary sports, not so much. So when I got back home, I dove into the published literature on the topic, and an unmistakable pattern emerged that seemed to support our findings. The World Happiness Report ranked Denmark as the happiest country. So why are the Danes so happy? It turns out their custom of frequently getting together with their friends to socialize is a major factor. So maybe happiness is only real when shared. Can I tell you a secret? It's not just the Jedi who draw strength from the, from the energy created by all living things. When you bond with other life around you, something like the force flows through your system. And it's your best protection against the dark side. <laughs> okay, if you're trying to avoid early mortality, surprisingly, the single most important thing you can do is connect with the people around you. Bond, emotionally bond with life around you. So this study, widely cited study, found that interpersonal support was more important than losing weight or treating high blood pressure or stopping smoking, and way more important than exercise. Twice as important if you're trying to uh, avoid early mortality. So, but you know, you could put these two together, couldn't you? You could bond with other life while you're playing with them, and get your exercise too. Like say, playing volleyball or pickleball or gardening with, you know, interacting with life. And when you do that, the force will be strong with you. When viewed in this light saber, our findings don't seem so implausible. I mean, if relationships really dwarf exercise for improving longevity, then Maybe badminton could improve be better for you and improve longevity better than, say, a treadmill machine. In fact, if you join a club that meets face-to-face -face once a month, even once a month, it improves well-being and longevity. By the way, you can't connect to the force via Wi-Fi. And this definitely does not count as playing outside with your friends. Julie is a dear family friend who's battling a difficult cancer right now. Recently, her daughter Emily organized a yoga class and about 200 people showed up to support her, including my two daughters and I. And we moved in unison with her for an hour while she did her favorite activity. And in that moment, as we played and prayed together as one, you could feel that force, that healing energy and it really, it really gave Julie, you can see how it, it really gave Julie more hope and courage. So face-to-face -face playing with others not only boosts your mood, it strengthens your immunity. It calms your heart. With each interpersonal relationship we make, when you're saying hi to the lady who gets your coffee, when you're petting your dog, when you're you know, bonding with your loved ones, this is how we build our village as Susan Pinker says. This is our most important lifelong mission. We used to, in cardiology, assume that a lot of strenuous exercise was ideal for promoting longevity. That was me. For decades, I hammered my body for hours a day competing for tri in triathlons, until I eventually figured out this was starting to take a toll on my heart and my joints. So in fact, Peter and Jacob and I did another study three years ago that was published. And we looked at joggers compared to non-joggers, and sure enough, we found that the joggers, the light joggers, had a robust reduction in mortality. But you know what? The strenuous high mileage runners up there in the red, they lost most of the protection. So in other words, if your goal is to 
improve your longevity and health and well-being, you don't need a large dose of strenuous exercise. In fact, an exhausting slog on the treadmill, as you've just seen, is one of the least effective ways of improving your life expectancy. When I was a child growing up in Grafton, North Dakota, near the Canadian border, my mother, Leatris there, her mantra, I think she was probably saying it right there while we were outside, but in one of the 20 days of summer there, but, uh, but she, um, she would say, you kids go outside and play with your friends and I don't want to see you home till dinner. So this turns out, I mean, she did it to get us out from underfoot, but it turns out to be brilliant advice for promoting health and longevity. Deep inside, each of you, you have an essence that hasn't changed much since you were seven. Do you know what that inner child wants more than anything else? More playtime. When, when my friend uh, Mark Allen t uh, says that when people whine to him that golf takes too long, he says, no, no, you don't get it. That's the best thing about golf. The funnest four hours of my weekend I spent out on the golf course playing with my friends. By the way, golf improves life expectancy almost as well as the racket sports in this study and well ahead of the solitary strenuous exercises. So I think that playing with your friends is even more important for men than women. You women are much more instinctively good at cultivating strong social networks. And that's a major reason why you generally outlive us by a, a wide margin. We, may, we sort of emotionally challenged males. For us, this is like a rare opportunity where we can actually build lasting friendships outside of work if we get in the habit of finding something where we can play with our friends. So Benjamin Franklin long ago said, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. When I can't find anybody else to play with me, I can count on my dog Lady uh, to be eager and enthusiastic to go out and play fetch or go for a walk or swim with me in the lake in the summer. There are, of, of the many reasons that homo sapiens and canines are best friends is that both species love to play. I have a patient who named his dog Five Miles just so that when he comes in for his annual visit and I inevitably ask him what is he doing for exercise, he can say, I walk five miles nearly every day. <laughs> But dogs, dogs are great for getting us outside, right? When the weather's inclement, the only people you see out when I'm out with Lady are other dog walkers. And if you noticed in that hierarchy of adjusted life expectancy, the outdoor sports like tennis, badminton, soccer, golf, cycling are the best for improving life expectancy, whereas the one that we always do indoors, going to the gym, dead last. When I think back, over my life, at the peak experiences in my life. None of them involved an afternoon of texting or tweeting, but they did involve lots of times playing with loved ones. My daughter Caroline and I both have fond memories of when she was a little girl, we'd go to the park on cool autumn days, and as the wind would blow the, the leaves off the tall trees, we'd run around and try to catch them before they hit the ground. My son Evan and I will never forget free-falling together uh, one afternoon of skydiving. But I want you to think in your own life. What are your most cherished memories? I'm betting they also involve playing with your loved ones. My wife Joan and I love to dance, even though we are most admittedly not dancing with your stars material. Uh, so we, but still, we make up for our lack of, of talent with an abundance of enthusiasm. And all I have to do is put on our favorite music in the kitchen, and, uh, and, and we're dancing and laughing like we don't have a care in the world. Frederick Nietzsche wrote a long time ago that the dancers appear insane to those who can't hear the music, which partly explains why our neighbors think we're so crazy. But, uh, but, but here's the thing. I love exercise. It's how I've always self-medicated my own hyperactive monkey mind. But I used to dismiss sports like horseback riding and bowling, pickleball, as like 
a waste of time because they don't get your heart rate in the training zone. But now I realize that the benefits of solitary exercise pale in comparison to the benefits of interactive play. You have my permission to forget about your heart rate. The most important thing about your exercise routine, if you're interested in well-being and longevity, is that it should involve a play date, even with your dog. We're never more truly ourselves and more fully alive than when we're playing. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. And this is not a, a bitter pill to swallow, right? I mean, unless you own a health club. And even there, even there you just emphasize group workouts, which is a great way to make friends and get fit. Life is short. This is our moment in the sun. Instead of spending your time laboring away at a solitary mind-numbing workout, I want you to rediscover the magic of play. Doctor's orders. Go outside and play with your friends. Thank you.